How do you persuade someone to stop bombing civilian areas, not to recruit children as soldiers, or that they shouldn't raid villages to pillage the only food supply? There has never been a greater need for effective advocacy for the protection of civilians in conflict and crisis. But how do we do this protection advocacy? What skills and techniques can we use? How can we identify decision makers? What tactics work? And how can we manage risks? Welcome to the Advocating for Protection podcast, where we bring you the real experiences of advocates in conflict and crisis. In each episode, you'll hear from those who are lobbying in the corridors of the UN buildings in New York, those who are face to face with armed actors at the front line of conflict zones and everything in between. They will tell us about their personal experiences, their successes, but also the challenges and how they overcame them. This podcast comes to you from the Global Protection Clusters Advocacy Working Group. Please be aware that it contains discussions of violence, abuse and exploitation faced by civilians in conflict and crisis. Good afternoon, good morning and welcome to the Advocacy for Protection podcast. My name is Roisin Mangan, and today I'm representing Save the Children, who, with Oxfam, co-chair the Advocacy Working Group at the Global Protection Cluster. Today I'm joined by two Oxfam colleagues, Abdul Wassam Mohammed. I'm Abdul Wassam Mohammed. I'm the Policy and Advocacy Manager at Oxfam in Yemen. I'm based in in Sana'a. I have been working with Oxfam for the past uh, four years now uh, in in Sana'a, and uh, Before that, I was uh, working on the development settings, uh, and a way before that, I was also working in Socotra Island in the tourism uh, field. But six to seven years uh, after the conflict, I had to shift to working in the humanitarian sector. And I have been doing this work now for the past four years with Oxfam. And Lawrence Robinson. My name is Lawrence Robinson. I'm Protection and Hunger Policy Advisor with Oxfam International. Um, I concentrate largely on conflict, uh, the conflict and hunger agenda, and the connection between food insecurity and protection. I've worked a little bit in the New York space before, so I'm excited to be to be talking about some kind of UN advocacy techniques and um, what Protection of Civilians Week looks like, and uh, how this how this year's event went. Great. Thanks, Lawrence. And that's a great segue into actually what we're going to be discussing today with both of you, which is the Protection of Civilians Week or POC Week in New York. However, maybe before diving into the POC Week, I think it would be great to hear a little bit about your experiences, what motivates you, how did you get into this line of work? So maybe, Abdul Wasa, you can start. As you may know, you know the Yemen has been suffering conflict uh, for the past uh, nine years now, and uh, it resulted into devastating uh, crisis uh, where we have up to two thirds of the country uh, or the population are dependent on humanitarian assistance, and also being affected myself from the conflict because when the conflict started we didn't have anything to do uh, actually and and i consider myself as a resilient uh, person and um, you know speaking some english and also i want to believe that myself i have the heart of an advocate and, and i always do this on a personal level and i saw this opportunity with oxfam and i thought this could be me and, and i i could do this and what i liked about uh, this work also the, the the values that are being demonstrated by oxfam and uh, i felt that i fit in and, and i can do this work and yeah, I have been doing it for the past four years now and uh, traveling across Yemen. It's, it's a challenging environment, but it is relieving, you know, when, when you know that you are doing good and, and you are there to, to support people who are in need. And also, uh, you know, most of what we do in terms of advocacy is creating spaces and also doing our best to advocate at national level and also external level. And uh, I would like to say, you know, Oxfam is one of the prominent NGOs who are doing this, you know, in terms of advocacy. And and we're able to do a lot in terms of, um, you know, ensuring people's voices are heard at national also and at at external uh, level. And uh, yeah, we hope we'll be also able to do that moving forward. 
Yeah, I think that's so interesting, Abdul Wasa, what you're saying about you being affected yourselves and then how you can then give back and advocate. And then obviously the link between national and international is where you come in, Laurence, around what motivates you to be in the global advocacy space? What do you think your, you know, your work is really contributing to the likes of Abdul Wasa's advocacy at the ground? For me, it's exactly that. So how do we build those connections to try to achieve some level of impact. Obviously, we're, we're working in really challenging environments and very different environments. And we need to try to utilize a whole range of spaces from New York to local, national, uh, political contexts to re- regional spaces with regional mechanisms. So uh, for me, it's all about building those connections um, and using different kinds of expertise to try to work out what our goal is, and then use our different, yeah, use our different skill sets to try to achieve that. So for me, I have some some background in, in New York advocacy. I've worked with a number of different civil society organizations, including coalition building organizations that work in New York to try to achieve, for example, steps forward at the UN Security Council, or, or, or when we don't have action, the UN Security Council steps forward in the UN General Assembly. Can we filter down some of these opportunities to to those that don't have access to New York typically? So that's that's typically where I where I feel like I'm I'm useful sometimes is is being able to 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 bridge a little bit between those uh, the actions happening at the the local and national level and then where can we achieve some things at the regional level at the international level? Yeah, and I think Oxfam is very very good at linking that critical piece, um, which kind of brings us up. You know, you're talking about the New York spaces and being able to leverage New York spaces. Lawrence, can you tell us actually what POC Week is for maybe those who don't know? Yeah, so um, Protection of Civilians Week takes place in New York every year. And it's basically a week dedicated to quite practical and I'd say constructive discussions on the theme of protection of civilians, which is a, it's a dedicated kind of topic on the UN Security Council agenda. They have uh, an open debate on uh, protection of civilians. The Secretary General briefs, there's a Secretary General report on protection of civilians, which is meant to be sort of this like comprehensive reporting mechanism on the state of protection of civilians across all the different contexts. So it includes important figures and trends on the degree to which civilians are being affected by conflicts, the degree to which they're being actively targeted, the targeting of medical facilities, uh, infrastructure for food security, a whole range of different topics related to how civilians uh, are being affected by, by conflict. Then within that open debate, you have many different member states, even beyond the UN Security Council, come in and, and, and make a statement. And then uh, you have side events on, on a whole range of topics, depending on what's interesting to, to civil society, UN agencies and member states. And like we worked on, on on conflict and hunger, which has sponsors from from a whole range of member states, UN agencies and civil society all coming together to agree we need to tackle this issue. So whereas the UN Security Council often talks about country specific issues uh, on its agenda, this space is a bit more, it takes a bit more of a step back and looks at the kind of global trends. Over to you, Abdul Wasa, in terms of, you know, what Lawrence is talking about is a wide spectrum of side events, all on thematic topics. However, you know, you came from Yemen to obviously elevate the protection needs and the protection concerns from Yemen. So can you maybe tell us a bit why you think it's effective, why you think it's useful and why you prioritized it? I think, you know, being in New York where it, you know, everything or they say, it all happens there. It is really a, a great opportunity for me, uh, especially in terms of prioritizing. I thought this is, is a, a great opportunity, you know, for me not only to uh, share the, my perspective, but also to ensure that you know the perspectives of Yemenis is also included. And also, I've been speaking to many civil society uh, leaders, uh, different communities. I was visiting uh, IDPs, the internally displaced communities, and also uh, trying to understand uh, from them and also to hear for their concerns and their views, and also what they need to happen in terms of you know decision making. And and a forum like the UN Security Council is is you know the best place. Uh, for for this and and also I managed to engage and, and take part in a couple of events you know in line or they reflect the situation in Yemen like the conflict induced uh, hunger it was really great you know to see the level of participation from the different you know uh, missions and and also member states 
and also uh, it was really great to hear other experiences from other contexts, uh, including context of conflict uh, where, you know, experiences were shared. Also, you know, I, I managed to an extent to share the uh, issues uh, and also the concerns from, from the communities in, in Yemen and also the mechanisms and, and the, the interventions that we do at Oxfam to try as much, you know, to alleviate the suffering of, of the civilians. Also, it was a good opportunity to pressure for action, for next steps. More things need to be done and actions need, need to, to be taken by the, the leaders uh, at the UN Security Council. And, and it was really a great opportunity and to communicate the concerns of the communities and also to pressure for action. Yeah, and I think that's the key word, action. Because, I mean, I was also at POC Week where I had the opportunity to meet you both. And the big question, I think, is exactly what you're saying, Abdul Wasa, is what's the action? So it'd be really interesting to hear what does Oxfam do to really move some of these discussions that happen at the POC Week forward? I reflect on this question quite quite often because often as advocates, we're, we're sort of encouraged to try to have these short term change goals, you know, over the space of a year, you create like a one year advocacy strategy with, you know, you're going to try and achieve X goal or, you know, within within a certain space of time, you're going to try and move, you know, influence one one actor to take X decision. Sometimes I believe one of the privileges of working for an organization like Oxfam is you get to step take a little bit of a step back and, and look at the situation, a bit of historical perspective and think critically about, OK, what will make a difference here? So. I'd say primarily one of the opportunities around Protection of Civilians Week is to contribute what you can a little bit towards crystallizing, strengthening some of these some of these norms that we talk about, international norms. And it's a really unsatisfying advocacy objective because it's so intangible. But just the fact that you're contributing to the conversation and widening the broadening the consensus around discussions on human rights in a space like the UN Security Council. The chances to interact with people on the margins, have those side conversations, have some bilateral meetings, and then have the opportunity to follow up with them afterwards, that's, I think, where the impact happens and where the opportunities lie. We can have meetings with different member states on the side. We can build off of the conversation. We can talk about what needs to happen next. And I'd say that's one of the key themes that I noticed, particularly within this year. There's so much consensus around the obstacles. We know that often the UN Security Council is is paralyzed or it's unable or unwilling to take action. So in most of the conversations, you hear discussion on ways to move that forward. Even from member states themselves, we need to explore new mechanisms, be that at the regional level through the UN General Assembly, through uh, perhaps through the group of friends on particular issues. We have outcome documents from these things that we can point and reference to, and we can work with those member states afterwards uh, and within within coalitions that are created actually during these events, we can work within those to push push the conversation forward. Yeah, and, and just maybe before moving on, can you maybe just explain what Group of Friends is or what the concept is, just in case anyone doesn't know? Yeah, essentially, it's groups of, of like-minded states uh, that support a particular issue. So, for example, there, there's a group of friends on conflict and hunger that includes a number of states that supported the resolution 20, uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2417 and want to see it implemented better. And Abdul Wasa, I'm, I'm very curious to hear from you in terms of, you know, you were saying that pre you leaving for New York, you went and you, you know, consulted with communities, consulted with different civil society experts, consulted with Yemenis that, you know, maybe can't leave. What happens when you go back from New York and everybody is scrambling for, I assume, asking you how it went and what's the outcomes? But I'm really curious to hear from you. You land back and then what happens? Well, yeah, you can you can imagine, you know, the the level of excitement uh, that you know people would have to hear the news, what happened there. But for me, uh, in in terms of you know bringing that experience back with me to Yemen and explaining, you know, the whole thing that happened, the processes, and what I was also able as as an advocate, because it was a, a huge responsibility on me that. I have to carry all these messages and concerns and perspectives of, of the civil society and, and the affected communities uh, as well to ensure that diplomats are aware or that, you know, we're trying to push them and also policy.
policy makers uh, in New York to make sure that, you know, the UN Security Council resolutions are taken seriously. And I have tried as much to link that to what's happening in Yemen because warring parties have always, you know, acted with impunity. And also the UN uh, Security Council members should do more to, to hold the conflicting parties accountable, including, you know, the, the conflict-induced hunger, which is a huge uh, a crisis in, in Yemen. I have always, you know, tried uh, my, my best in all these meetings to ensure that policymakers are aware or they are hearing the voices uh, from Yemen, the perspective, including on the peace process, for example, that Yemenis want a lasting peace. Uh, need more action from the UN Security Council and from all member states to ensure that, you know, protection of civilians is, is prioritized and also that access to services is always prioritized by the conflicting parties. Because, you know, to be honest, for uh, civilians, civil society, and, and also the, the activists that have been talking to people, they hear that the UN Security Council is concerned, this politician is concerned about what's happening, but people need to see action. I, I think, you know, we just need to keep knocking the door and keep pressuring those politicians, the different targets, the, the powerful nations to ensure that they are doing what they have to do, you know, to, to ensure that people are getting what they want. That's why, you know, I always uh, make sure that the, the, the people I meet around here in Yemen, you know, I assure them that I have delivered the message and, and I ensure that the international community, you know, take concrete measures, but we will keep the pressure on that, you know, and also to support the flow of commercial supplies and to do something around, you know, addressing the, the economy, deteriorating economy and also the access to food. And the fight needs to, to uh, you know, to continue. And, and uh, as advocates, we can never be, you know, relieved and, until uh, we are sure that, you know, something out of these meetings is, is uh, you know, becoming fruitful and that the voices of, of the community affected people is, is always heard by, by these politicians. And I think that's such a hot topic these days. How do we make sure the affected communities are central to these discussions? And I think your experience of consulting, moving, delivering the message and then feeding back is an, you know, it's an incredible example of how that global and national and, and regional levels, as you were saying, Lawrence, should be connecting. Just I'm curious around a question around, you know, obviously, the POC week it has a number of different side events. You know, we're talking about a number of different things from conflict induced hunger to attacks on healthcare to access that protects. Just wondering, Lawrence, how do you kind of pre POC week really prioritize, you know, what Oxfam is going to lean in on? And maybe you could talk us a bit through kind of what the preparation looks like for that. Yeah, it, it takes a lot. You really do need that access to New York to, to have the connections to understand what events are going to happen. What are the main themes of, of POC week? A lot of that isn't really transparent in the beginning and it's not all online. So it is really helpful to have access to connections uh, with different organizations and, and agencies in, who are present in New York with that access to try to get a sense of the lay of the land. And then you can have those those discussions with your key colleagues in your organization and with other other allies on on what to prioritize. We used our kind of representative in New York and our connections there and, and other allies to, to do that. We have a bit of a brainstorm amongst ourselves. We, we have to think carefully as well, like, is this still a space that, that we are going to achieve some impact in? It, what To what degree is it worth investing uh, time and resources in it? We have to be really critical about that. We have to think about that because there's always an opportunity cost. There might be something else that we could do with that budget or, or, or with that, the, that time and resources elsewhere. So we have to think that through. But for us, at least for, for this week, we, we did think it was, was critical to, to engage, particularly to ensure that we have Abdul West's voice and the voices that he's supporting from, from Yemen in, in these rooms to make sure that those perspectives are represented. This space is not typically one in which affected communities are all that present. You have the UN Security Council, which doesn't include any kind of dedicated seat, right, to civil society. We see more and more civil society briefers come in, uh, which were supported by different member states, which is encouraging. And you see that happening more and more. And then the, but the side events are great in terms of actually having member states, those that take some kinds of decisions at the international level on these topics, that they actually get to hear from affected communities and, and those representing them. So that's really encouraging. 
if I if I look back at this year and, and what we were thinking, we were looking at the at the context, humongous levels of, of conflict induced hunger. We knew that in this year's POC week that they were going to that was going to be a primary theme. So we thought it being important to to be there, not with really specific change goals or anything like that, but to be in the room so to, to make those connections to our to our partners, local level partners and and colleagues in in countries and in, in regions, so that then we can build on that further. For example, in the conversations on on conflict and hunger. To try to, as advocates, to try to make sure that there's a continuity of conversation between New York and other regions, um, between New York and other kind of policy spheres on, okay, well, what does this resolution mean? What can we do with it? How can we actually implement it in practice? And that's one of the key things with with resolutions from the UN Security Council or anything. It doesn't necessarily mean anything uh, until it's implemented on the ground. Ultimately, these are these these are statements, uh, pieces of paper, and things that need to be need to be implemented. I mean, you, you've yeah, you said a huge amount there, and I think maybe just back to you, Abdul Wasa, in terms of preparation priority. So you have global colleagues like Lawrence deciding and and working with co- collective colleagues, figuring out what the priorities are, matching it with the actual advocacy priorities of the member states, talking to the New York colleagues, and you're there in Yemen. Can you maybe just explain to us then? What's your preparation and prioritization look like? You know, you were talking about going to consult the communities, but what does it individually look like? How do you prepare for some of these conversations you had? Yemen is, is a very challenging environment uh, to, to, to work in. And uh, when it comes to priorities, either access or, or funding shortages or fuel crisis or a, a protection of civilian crisis, uh, uh, landmines, uh, a lot of devastating issues that are, you know, uh, sometimes recurrent, uh, sometimes, you know, they just come out of the blue and, and we have to deal with them. We have also climate change crisis as well in, in Yemen, you know, where we have floodings that thousands of people get affected. And I, I want to mention here what a, a colleague, a civil society colleague has uh, mentioned, you know, the, the importance and the significance of NGOs like us, Oxfam, you know, where we have all these resources and we have colleagues like Lawrence and, and other colleagues in New York and in Washington, D.C., who always, you know, spare no effort to create spaces for us, but also for the civil society uh, organizations, uh, speakers, leaders. Sometimes we are able also to secure spaces for civil society uh, speakers to brief the UN Security Council, which is a, a very important step, because she believed that the, the, the narratives are always competing there. It, it's always either, you know, conflicting parties who are trying to push with their narratives and the international community, they don't have that much of an insight of what's really happening in the ground. And this is, you know, one of the ways where we can bridge that gap and, and ensure that, you know, we are bringing the ground realities and we are bringing civil society speakers and, and to share their experiences, to provide their, their observations and also their anecdote information about what's really happening and what also the perspective of the communities themselves, uh, how, how they want to see things moving and what they want also to see the, the international community doing. The, the level of dedication from colleagues has been really outstanding in which, you know, uh, myself and the civil society colleague managed to uh, meet with a lot of, uh, you know, different missions, uh, different officials. They were very interested to know more about what's happening and having uh, opportunities like this is, is really great and it brings the ground reality and it also it stresses the urgency of the level of action that is needed to ensure that people are protected and the theme was really perfect for this. Yeah, and I think Abdul Wasa, that's great wording to end our session today. I mean, you're talking about bringing communities up to the New York level, having incredible collaboration with New York colleagues, both internal and external to Oxfam. Today, we we attempted to talk about and to share what POC Week means for Oxfam and for us as humanitarian advocates who work on protection of civilians. I really want to thank both of you, both Lawrence, who really was able to provide that global understanding. And I think Abdul Wasa, you know, your messages and your quest for making sure that those spaces are being held and the platforms are correct for the right people. So I think 
Thank you both so much. I've really, really enjoyed our conversation. And maybe for those who are interested in, you know, understanding more about POC Week, you can go to the UN OCHA website. Thank you so much, both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Advocating for Protection podcast. It's produced by the Global Protection Clusters Advocacy Working Group, which is co-led by Save the Children in Oxfam and includes members from national and international NGOs and UN agencies. You can find out more information about the Advocacy Working Group on globalprotectioncluster.org. Look out for the Protection Advocacy Toolkit whilst on this website. And if you have feedback or suggestions for future episodes, email us at protectionteam at oxfam.org.